Hello Internet, so nice to see you and we are live for another music theory talk. If you are watching this, say hi in the chat and then let me know from where you're watching and maybe what time it is in your time zone. And I have people here writing me hi from Hong Kong and I'm thinking what time it is in Hong Kong right now? <laughs> is this in the, are you guys awake at 2am in the evening in the night to, to, to watch me or? <laughs> okay. Anyway. Say hi in the chat and tell me what time it is in your time zone. I'm, I'm just curious to see at, uh, when, when I'm in your day, <laughs> essentially. Very good. So, tis the season, okay? I don't know. We are living in different parts of the world. I'm living in Canada and I can tell you it's freezing here, <laughs> okay? So, it's, it's very Christmassy. It's been very Christmassy for months, actually, <laughs> for months and months. Uh, so time to talk about seasonal music and today to help me actually she's probably gonna do most of the heavy lifting here because <laughs> she's the one who really knows this stuff i have here a special guest you guys have seen her already every time i had her here people really love the live stream i got email after that telling bring her back again <laughs> okay she's great so without further ado let me introduce you guys to Diana de Cabarus, songwriter extraordinaire. Hello. Good to see Hi, you Diana. all. Hi, Diana. So I know the answer to that, but I'm asking you again for the benefit of the public. How are you feeling today? <laughs> well, you know, as somebody once said to me, I um, have symptoms, but I'm not really ill. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a very good one. <laughs> I might blow my nose at some point, so apologies to everyone watching if that happens. I'll try and I'll try and avoid that. But it's an instrument too. <laughs> Let me put it this That's way. true. That's true. <laughs> okay, okay, guys. So I see people from Frankfurt, from the UK, New Jersey, Stuttgart, Germany, Hong Kong. One a.m. One a Ada, you were watching us, and it's one a.m. in your time zone. Internet points for you. <laughs> Lots of internet points. From Colorado, and it's freezing cold in Colorado too. We have people from all around the world, and they are all here to see you, Diana. So, and we're going to talk about how to write seasonal music. Now, I think we should start first explaining people what you mean with seasonal music, what we mean, what we songwriter mean <laughs> with seasonal music. So, let's give a roundup about that. Well, um, we can start with Christmas seasonal music or music that's kind of associated with Christmas. But I think what's interesting about it is it doesn't have to necessarily just be to do, you know, if, if we're taking Christmas music, that is actually a massive category because you've got carols through all the ages of carols. You know, there's some very ancient carols. God rest you, merry gentlemen. A personal favourite is, I think that's from the 16th century. So all the way up to contemporary pop music that has a lot of a lot of um christmas songs um there could be classical music of various kinds that has a sort of christmas theme it can also be something that's more associated with winter kind of suggests christmas doesn't doesn't necessarily explicitly go too much directly into christmas so i think it's a really interesting place to start partly because of it's like an amazing controlled experiment of having one start point, like one prompt, and then seeing over centuries and centuries and all kinds of different styles, artists, composers, how different people have responded to it and what as songwriters we can uh, think about in terms of their responses, both in terms of lyrics and in terms of arrangements and structure. Think about our own work. However, the principles that we might discover in this could be applied to any theme. So it could be... You know, there's lots of occasions that come around every year, like there's birthdays, there's Valentine's Day, there's or Halloween. <clears throat> so seasonal could be just something that um, that recurs. And as a songwriter, it's really great to have music that you can play on more than one occasional that has like an extended lifespan, um, partly for your own benefit, that you get the chance to recycle something and hear it again. I didn't mean recycling in a bad way. I just meant that you get to hear it again. Um, I was in a, a trio 
up in Edinburgh, you know, nearly 10 years ago, we, we released a winter EP and it's really nice getting the chance to play that again every year. Um, lots of other music that I might have written from a similar period is sort of slightly, you know, I guess I could dust it off, but it's, there's less sort of reason to. So it's nice from your point of view as a writer, but it's also really nice to have something, you know, music has a real, can have a real ritual function. And, and if, if you th take an anthropological view, and to have something that you can contribute to those types of occasions is, is really nice. It's like a lovely contribution to be able to make. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why you might want to do that. Well, you know, a couple of big reasons why you might want to consider writing something that has a seasonal or thematic element to it. And if we, if we kind of move away from something that's uh, a season of the year to something that's just a theme, so it might not be associated with a particular time of the year, but it might be a theme that crops up a lot. And you you may think, oh God, everything is that everything that could possibly be said about breaking up or falling in love or has already been said, like, how can I possibly write about this in a fresh way? Some of the same things apply as a, to seasonal music. So there's um, a couple of different ways you can look at it. I wanted to add one thing on what you say that um, it's an amazing control experiment indeed, because it's there's, there's a similar theme and, and we can span hundreds and hundreds of years of people thinking about that and writing music about that, because especially for Christmas or winter songs, huh, we go back centuries <laughs> with that. I mean, there are melody like Adeste Fidelis. Uh, uh, and, uh, Okay, we all know that. Okay, and uh, this is a very old melody. The legend says that it was a um, monk in, a, in an abbey or something composing it, and, but it's probably even older than that. Okay, maybe just wrote it down. <laughs> okay, it could be made you evil for all we know. Uh, and we have more modern music. Okay, um, the, probably the most famous Christmas song is White Christmas, no? Something like that. Okay. Um, which is a jazz song, essentially, with, with a much more advanced harmony than, previous, than, than the previous example. Okay. And we, have, and we are still writing Christmas song. And which is interesting because, as you can comment later, now writing Christmas songs seems to be writing some easy jazz songs that remember, remind us of White Christmas. It's such an iconic example that people try to copy that, essentially. But we have such a span, such a range of different uh, styles, different moods, different uh, uh, approaches to seasonal music, even just, again, for winter or for Christmas more specifically, um, even just in Western music. I mean, I'm not, I'm not even going worldwide <laughs> in, in, with Western music. And it, it, it's, it's amazing to see how all those people were able to write around the same kind of topic and they have, have so many different approaches. And I think it's a great opportunity for any songwriter to go and study that. It's kind of a unique opportunity. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't see except for the generic theme of love. Okay, I don't see anything that has been written so much in music. What do you think? Yeah, I think, um, well, actually, when you were playing those chords there for White Christmas, I was wondering if there were, um, what a music theory sort of approach to thinking about Christmas music would be. Um, I guess a very sort of simple, idea would be there's going to be a result a strong resolve um but <clears throat> i was looking at a few different christmas songs and um even within just the theme of christmas there's th there's three really popular ones that i found after about 10 minutes that have the same chord progression they have the sort of uh one six four five so have yourself a merry little christmas last christmas my Armageddon warning for people in the uk um and then uh santa baby um so I suppose a, a rewind from that would be if you're going for something nostalgic and sentimental, that particular chord progression is sometimes associated with um, that kind of mood. 
Um, but I mean, in in this then I think moves on to the question of what register you want. So White Christmas and all the, in a way, all the White Christmas alike songs that live in the Buble cave and come out when the stone is rolled away on the 26th of November. Um, uh, they, one could perhaps say that they are tapping into a certain version of Christmas that's nostalgic, sentimental, might have been invented in the 40s and 50s, discuss, um, um, or by the Victorians. You know, that, that's one, I, and that's not a criticism, it's just, you know, distinctions between what version of Christmas are we talking about. Sacred music would have perhaps a, a more sombre, you know, there might be a more sombre register. Um, pop music can be sort of melodramatic about Christmases that don't go to plan, or, um, and it, in terms of how you approach the composition, I think what's interesting, both in sacred and secular music, and um, is, is what register you're going to choose and then that's going to affect the musical elements that support it so uh there could be a register that's quite internal and reflective and that might re you might translate that musically by having not having tons and tons of chords um and by a sort of distilled kind of quality whereas that or there could be something more celebratory uh rock and friend christmas tree you know and that might have you're going to have obviously i mean if you were going to picture, if you're like, right, tomorrow I have to wake up and be Quincy Jones, what am I going to put in this arrangement? You're going to be like, I'm going to have strings, I'm going to have brass, I'm going to have jib bells, you know, and it might, some of those things might be a bit predictable, but they do also immediately conjure that kind of feeling of um, sleigh bells and all the rest of it. So uh, you've got this really wide register of what uh, part of the Christmas spectrum <laughs> you want to, you want to show people. And I think um, that's, a really great starting point to think of how you're going to make your composition interesting and specific um, because it's basically what part of this experience do you want to show people and do you want to communicate to people so white christmas is wants to communicate a kind of uh emo con emotionally warm connected sentimental sort of delightful cozy you know chestnuts on an open fire um, having a nice time, you know, it's, it's not a stressy song. It's not an anxious song. It's it's communicating, describing, and e you know, even the, the things that, if you had to draw a picture of each verse, they're quite nice scenes, aren't they, that are being depicted. Um, whereas something like um, God Rest You Merry Gentlemen, the merry in that one actually initially meant uh, mighty. So merry in the 16th, 17th century, so it's kind of God make you mighty. So that's more like, Ugh, you know, in a, in a way, and, and the melody, the harmony reflects that. It's like, you know, and there's some cool versions. One might even be yours of like very rocking interpretations of those. Um, and that's a completely different register. It's kind of like a, we're in the middle of winter. We're going to like reaffirm our mission to be mighty. Um, and probably winter was a lot more hardcore to survive in the middle ages than it is now. Um, so, uh, and then you have pop songs, personal favorite, 2000 Miles by Her Majesty Chrissy Hind and the Pretenders. Um, and she takes, that's, although it's got quite an uplifting overall atmosphere with this nice little riff and uh, a very kind of standard pop turnaround, um, she, lyrically, she's foregrounding themes of separation and missing somebody and somebody being far away. And, you know, at the time where people are celebrating being together, if you're not together with somebody, that's an aspect of the experience that you could draw out. Or if um, you really miss somebody and you wish you were with them and you feel their absence more keenly when everyone else is getting together, then that's something to, you know, the lyrics and that's that's all are quite simple. But it's, um, you know, it's all about how it's snowing and it's cold and uh, 2,000 miles is very far. So that's more of a sort of... Um, it is a little bit more reflective and a little bit more, it's not kind of cozy, that song. So it doesn't have to be a schmaltz fest, but it can be a schmaltz fest and that can be great too. Um, what is your, do you have some favorite Christmas music? Well, there is, it's very tempting to go and say, 
it's this chord progression or it's this musical theory element or it's this scale or this but it, everything you every, every time we try to do that we find too many counter example let me let me explain for instance you find that many christmas song has the chord progression one six uh, two five no or six two five one whatever um but that's also a common chord progression in jazz <laughs> and it's also a common chord progression in classical music <laughs> because it's, it's actually pretty common there too so it's not typical of christmas song it's just that chord progression seems to land to also be um, christmas or wintry or that kind of song but not only that okay and uh, even older melodies like adesta fidelis etc um a very standard chord progression there is nothing in the chord progression that is special um i have a question here from jason on in the chat the desk is there's a mode that suits Christmas music with a universal subject. Well, you will start thinking it's probably major because most of the Christmas songs are in major, but a few are in minor. So, and, but there's nothing. I don't remember a Christmas song in Mixolydian, for instance, or in Lydian or in Dorian. The, in Dorian, I could, see, I, I could see that, but I don't remember any specific example. Um, but I mean, we have most... Christmas songs are in major. Usually, then you go out of key in, on the dominant side. So you add a sharp and then come back to the major key. But a few famous ones are in minor. I mean, um, okay, uh, um, Carol the Bells is in minor. Um, God rest you, merry gentlemen, is in natural minor. Um, Or come Emmanuel is in minor, okay. There are a few others. So you cannot even pinpoint a specific mode. You can pinpoint it's mostly major, some in a minor, typically natural minor. And that's it. <laughs> okay. Some time ago, a few years ago, came out a video on YouTube saying that there was the Christmas chord, something called the Christmas chord. I don't know if you remember that. And um the guy in the video said that the Christmas chord was uh, essentially the half diminished chord. Okay, you used in four positions. So in a key you could have, I don't know, in the key of D, you would have any kind of chord progression here, say something like that. And then if we put the, um, this um, half diminished in, in as, a, as the fourth chord, essentially, or as a second chord too, or two. So like that. And these will be the Christmas chord going coming back to the first one. Um, it was an interesting video because you can see that they, they were cutting part of the interview and asking the guy later, he actually got an hour of interview and only three minutes came out on, on tape. <laughs> okay. And he actually did not meant to say that this was the Christmas chord. They essentially edited this out of him. <laughs> and there was a big backslash from other music theorists, like, no, this chord is used everywhere, which is true, this chord is used everywhere. And, um, and this guy started receiving actually a lot of hate email from everybody. <laughs> and now he doesn't work in music anymore. He has a cooking channel on YouTube. <laughs> that, that, that took a strange turn, huh? <laughs> And, and he keeps saying, I didn't mean to say that it was the Christmas chord. <laughs> it, 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 it appears in several Christmas chords, okay? in several Christmas songs, but no, it's not the Christmas chord per se. <laughs> okay. Um, moral of the story, never release an interview when something you say can be... <laughs> never release an interview if it's going to get edited, because it, it can end up very really far from what you expect. The thing is, this idea of using the second or the fourth chord as a half diminished, it's a um, typical jazz, chord, jazz trick. It's really not uh, um, special. And since a lot of people associate that specific kind of easy jazz with Christmas, if you use it, a lot of people will associate that. But I think there's something more. <clears throat> I think to make a song Christmas, you need to do something different. Okay. Um, lyrics are definitely more important in, from this point of view. 
I think the arrangement is even more important. Uh, we were having a conversation, you and I. So I don't, I don't want, I don't want to say this when, when it's when it's actually you who wrote this first in the conversation, but having a, having um, a specific instruments in the arrangement, like I don't know, sleigh bells, okay, or something like that, really helps in the Christmasiness of the song. Okay, so and again, that's your idea, but. Um, yeah, I don't think we can boil it down to just chord progression or scale degrees or modes. Those could be. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna put I'm not gonna put something in Frisian dominant. Okay, like. Mm. That's not Christmassy. I, maybe somebody can make this Christmassy. Okay, but I don't see how you can. It would be a challenge, okay, but it's not the natural choice for that. But it's a fact that most Christmas songs have some bells around, <laughs> okay, and they have a general specific mood. I mean, I mean, again, like you say, you can go in different direction, but many Christmas songs tend to be pretty joyful, and so that the, the, there is this kind of springiness in the rhythm and and, and bubbliness in the in, in, in the rhythm part and so on and so forth. So, this is just to answer that. We cannot be reductionist too much and take this down to single notes and chords. It's not going to happen this way. It's more organic. What do you think? I agree. <clears throat> and I think that um, if we, if you take the, so this is something I always find really helpful to remember, like an average song has got time for 150 to 300 words. So that's not very many words. You, you know, j j just notice here, I, I'm, I'm just amazed at this precision. I never counted that. I, nev I never thought about that. I'm just amazed, you guys, you have this down to this precision. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 150 words. Other people have counted and I've reaped the benefit of their research. But when you think about it like that, um, you you know, there's there's it's, it's like a kind of series of sort of concentric circles. There's like 140,000 words in the English language. There's going to be room for about 300 of them in your song. So um, when you start from the idea of what part, you know, there's a lot of different experiences within the idea of Christmas that one could choose to describe. So it's almost like if you spent five minutes or 10 minutes writing down everything that you can think of that's vaguely associated with Christmas from the theme of spending time with friends and family, uh, the expectations we have that are sometimes not fulfilled, being bored and frustrated with your family after a day, um, you know, or having a great time seeing them again and feeling delighted, um, or presents, you know, Santa baby, slip a sable under the tree, um, just a yacht and a duplex, etc. will be fine. Um, you know, that 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 song is quite lighthearted in its register and it's choosing to, it's talking about presents and, you know, delight in material objects. And then, um, Last Christmas, you broke my heart. I'm, you know, I'm not giving you the treasure of my emotions anymore. Uh, or I'll give it to somebody that, uh, you know, so the, there's different registers even sort of within pop music. And um, once you've decided what register you want and what part of the emotional spectrum you want to communicate, then you're gonna think about um, a scenario that, where that is, that is apparent. So if you're, if you're thinking about being separated from somebody, talking about the fact that they're 200 miles away and whether they're coming back or not, is that's the scenario in which we can understand that. So um, then you're gonna choose, the musical choices you're gonna make would ideally be sort of congruent with that. So uh, for in a pop song where the theme, where you're showcasing something that's joyful about Christmas, it doesn't necessarily have to be major, but it probably is gonna resolve. Um, and it probably is going to have at least some parts that are in major, um, major keys or modes. Um, and like Tomasa said, you're going to have instrumental and arrangement aspects that are going to be reminiscent of Christmas. So if you think about um, a more recent example, Fleet Foxes. Da, 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 so um, again, it doesn't kind of explicitly talk about Christmas as a reference to Michael, but there's snow and there's uh, it's actually got quite dark lyrics. It's like, you know, um, uh, blood on the snow, um, which I only realized when I learned it because um, it doesn't give that effect at all. Um, and there's lots of bells in that. 
Um, actually, when you're playing the diminished chord, one thing that came to mind is it sounds quite like Jack Frost. If you were writing the soundtrack to a children's animation about Jack Frost, you might have some sort of little, little, and you played a couple of um, the voicings higher up the neck. And I always think with guitar, when you go higher up the neck, you get these twinklier sounds. And of course, they don't only have to be used with music to Christmas, but it is easier to associate the idea of coldness, frostiness with um, higher pitches. If you imagine the kind of like ping of the crack of breaking ice or uh, those kinds of sounds, they're um, easier to associate with little bright chords. Um, and so I would have, in a way, I would always start with thinking about what it is that I would want to describe, what part of all of the themes and emotions that could be associated with Christmas or the Christmas time of year, whether it's secular or, <clears throat> uh, you know, from the sacred point of view, there's the birth of Jesus, but there's also um, a lot of other things that associations of winter have, you know, there's certain things being dormant, there's maybe being the relinquishing and withdrawing aspect of winter, you know, the idea of things becoming seeds under the ground, um, our outer layers falling away, all the foliage has fallen away. Um, so once you've decided what aspect you want to foreground, then you can make choices about modes and chord progressions that might support that. If something's going to be really joyful, you're probably going to have quite animated rhythms and um, uh, lots of instruments in the kind of higher end um, and a lot of propulsion. If it's going to be more contemplative, you might change chords at a slower rate, things like that. So I think the the thing which allows you to treat something in your own way and have your own response to it and for that to be fresh is for you to actually consider what what it is that you respond to most strongly about that time of year and how you can unpack that emotion into an idea and then what musical elements would align with that like what chord choices what rhythm elements would make sense along with that I'm just thinking about, about your suggestion wait, actually let me put there you go. Thinking about your suggestions about playing the chords up high on the on the fretboard because they are more twinkly and sparkly, and it's true. And I just realized in how many movies you hear something like that. You hear either something like that, and it's and it's. If you just imagine a scene like this, it's like the, the quiet contemplative mo moment of a, of a movie. And they're sitting on the porch with all the snow, okay, maybe drinking something warm and talking. Okay, and, and, and there's always this kind of sound. Um, it may be done with the guitar, it may be done with, with a harp sometimes. So a harp or um, occasionally you will have something like a, a vibraphone or a, 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 a celesta or something like that or so this is kind of very sparkly instruments okay and and, and it's this kind of chords too so yes perfect i think i think you got it exactly there it's it's a combination of range kind of chord and the half diminished chord it's slightly dissonant but not too dissonant uh, and it can easily go into the comedic range because i mean <laughs> okay <laughs> you've all heard this kind of thing so um, it's all those tricks can help <laughs> essentially it also depends because i mean we are um, we are talking a lot about Christmas songs, like in the sense of pop songs, um, self-contained three to four, three to four minutes and a half song uh, pieces of music. Um, but there is a lot to be to be said about, for instance, uh, uh, mood music or film music or incidental music, meaning background music essentially that expresses Christmas. So if you watch a movie, you may have um, a cue in a movie. It could be like 30 seconds 
with an orchestra and that uh, um, can express Christmas in just a few seconds without having to be two or three or four minutes. Or you could have a longer shoot, um, again, orchestral in a movie, typically at the end. I'm thinking here, of course, uh, Tchaikovsky, I mean, uh, the Nutcracker. Anybody who wants to write film music and wants to express Christmas has to, has to know the Nutcracker note by note, okay, and copy it relentlessly, okay. And um, everybody has seen the movie Home Alone, right? Home Alone. Everybody knows that movie. When they are, if, if you go back and see it, when they are running in the airport, in the first movie, when they are running in the airport, there is a mu the music in the background. It's a very animated music, okay? I think it was John Williams who did that music. And that music is definitely a copy of one of the dances in the Nutcracker. But the genius thing is that while the arrangement is exactly the same, okay, the arrangement is exactly the same, but the melody is inverted. <laughs> Whenever the original melody goes up, this goes down and vice versa. So it's not exactly the same thing. It feels like something new. And um, it's a very intelligent copying, very intelligent. Um, but yeah, essentially. <laughs> The Nutcracker came for some to, uh, came to define what Christmas orchestral music is with all these kind of sparkly sounds and the use of specific instruments. So anybody who wants to write that thing has to know that thing by heart, um, which is also useful, incidentally, when you go and arrange a pop song because lots of Christmas songs have uh, uh, even a small orchestra, a small orchestra ar arrangement. So maybe they don't have the full uh, uh, romantic orchestra, 120 elements, but they, ha they may have some strings or they may have some woodwinds, so they, may de they definitely have some percussions with sparkly sound. So it's good to know about how to arrange those things to make those specific sounds and, to, and how to do it with few instruments. One of the genius things about the Nutcracker that people don't talk much about that is that all those pieces of the dance sounds very distinctive because every one of the pieces features one or two instruments very heavily and the other are just accompanying. So they are all timbrically different. And you remember them because of, the, of this. So you can create that effect with a, with a, with a few instruments. You don't have the whole to have the to, to use the whole orchestra and this is important when you write pop music because if you can get away with five orchestral players as opposed to 120 that's a big saving in your album budget and that's a consideration that has to be made okay because because <laughs> okay but anyway um what I wanted to ask you. Uh, and I'm blown away by the guy who doesn't work in music anymore because people hated his diminished chord. <laughs> I mean, I just think that they liked his ragu a bit better. I mean, honestly, the cookie channel is pretty good. <laughs> Be, being a foodie myself, his cooking channel is actually pretty good. I'm just, I'm just, uh, the internet is a strange place. Okay. And the, the, you, I mean, having, having my little YouTube channel myself, I know that you can, you can make a video and do everything perfectly and then maybe sleep on saying something or not say something specifically precise. And then the 90% of comments are going to beat on that. And, uh, which is okay. I mean, I'm, who cares? The problem is that occasionally some people really, really, really start to care about that little thing. You said that it's not exactly precise. It's not, or it's not precise in their opinion, or it doesn't work with their previous experience, or they studied a different version of theory, or more often they studied the wrong version of theory and they think that you were wrong. <laughs> okay. Cause this happens. And um, some of them really takes this to, this to heart. I had people writing me, I mean, uh, specific people writing me eight emails for years for something I said in videos years ago. <laughs> That's an opportunity to take the Christmas theme of forgiveness and write them a festive anthem in which um, 
you you ask for their forgiveness for your lack of precision. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm quite intrigued by the 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 Stop the Cavalry is an anti-war song that ends up as a Christmas hit because of the added brass parts. Um, that's interesting. Um, do we think that, I mean, brass parts definitely have that warm effect. Um, but also, uh, if he hadn't, if it hadn't been an anti-war song, because peace, peace is a big Christmas theme. If we think, if we start thinking about the overlap you know, between you have all kinds of examples, like the one, the, the Christmas Day truce in No Man's Land of World War One. You know, peace on earth, good will to men. That that's definitely um, even if we can struggle to have peace in our own family gatherings. Sometimes has that ever happened to any of you? Um, um, looking forward to seeing you guys in a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, yes, if the theme hadn't been compatible with Christmas maybe the addition of the brass parts by themselves wouldn't have been enough. But since the theme, an anti-war song does overlap with, you know, it's thematically congruent with Christmas, um, that that was a stylistic and arrangement element that kind of like pulled it into the Christmas area. Um, I was thinking about, uh, when I saw that comment, I was also thinking about um, War Is Over by John Lennon. And and when you were, we were talking about brass bells, I was like, choirs huge like big you know especially children's choirs now i know you can have children's choirs and brass in songs that have got nothing to do with christmas such as mr blue sky but if you you know they are evocative of uh christmas because carols hymns choirs and churches those those things are all very um they all remind us of christmas and um in terms of choosing a theme if you want to highlight peace, one way to talk about peace is to discuss how maybe we're going to not have war. Like that's one way of talking about peace. Um, I can't exactly remember how the verses go um, uh, to war is over, but um, yeah, it's a kind of, it's a, it emphasizes connectivity and uh, goodwill to all, but in a pop song setting without, you know, it's still secular. Um, so that's interesting too. And this is a much more, uh, it's kind of a silly example, but it, 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 it uses the same principle. I went to a nativity play uh, the other day and the nativity was told from the perspective of Morris the donkey. So Morris the donkey was sort of saying what was happening and there was some little songs and Morris was like, oh, there's a mouse in my manger. There's a cat in my manger. What's that doing? Now there's a dog in my manger. And then, of course, eventually there's a baby Jesus in the major. But, um, it, you know, it's the same from, you know, all, all the teachers that have to arrange their nativities. They've got to find a way to tell the story. And telling it from the perspective of Morris the donkey was a very fresh perspective. So even in that one bit of Christmas, which is the nativity, there's still lots of different angles that you could take on it. Um, the, in, that was the sort of the donkey eye view. Uh, so I think really the way that you can have something that's original is to explore your own response to it and what it makes you think about and then what you, what bit of that you most want to communicate because that's going to give you your best ideas um and so whether it's a, a mood or a specific scenario or um you know you can even there's lots of interesting ways of starting it you can start you can get a christmas card that has a specific image on it imagine that, that image is a scene in a film what happens before and after tell that story in a song and now what instruments do you think would sound good with that and go from that point of view? But let's let, what would we do tomorrow? if we had to write a song and we didn't have um, much equipment, like maybe we had the type of stuff you'd find in it, maybe we're guitarists or we play the keyboard and we got the type of equipment that you'd find in a typical home studio. Um, and we got to, we got to just do what we can. Um, I think I would, I would definitely have some pizzicato guitar so maybe I'd be like, uh, probably not that though. <laughs> That's a little bit, um, um, maybe more like that. Um, and then I'd have some little chords up here. And then I'd layer my vocals a bunch of times. So I'd have harmonies and I'd have double tracking. 
So uh, for those of you that do have like little setups at home, you can even do garage band on your phone. Um, if you haven't done this already, if you double track each vocal part, you get this um, uh, kind of snowy feel. Well, I mean, it's something which could be quite snowy. Um, and you could have, so, you, so then that would just be with guitar and uh, vocals, but then you could get um, any of the stuff in your kitchen if you don't have bells, and you could do a little like cowbell type effect. You could have, um, there's lots of things that you can repurpose. Uh, it's like I can see where I am now. There's this, gotta be very careful because I'm staying in somebody else's house. That could be quite a good sleigh bell maybe, or, you know. So there's lots of things that you could find good noises with, even if you didn't have a cool string section to draw on. Um, what would you what would you add to that, Tommaso? I think the, the layering of the vocals will work great. Um, I mean, it's not just an opinion, I'm thinking Enya, <laughs> uh, especially early Enya, when es essentially the song were, was her voice layered over and over and over and over and over, hundreds of times probably. And that can sound really Christmassy, but yeah, you have a lot of things in your house that can sound uh, Christmassy, sparkly. I mean, if you have a couple of glasses, ping, <laughs> and with that, a good microphone and a little bit of uh, digital trickery, you can make this sound as good as you want. So yeah, you don't have to have the big, I mean, you can do the big arrangements later. I, I will care more if I'm doing this in my house, uh, to have um, a general mood, good lyrics, good melody. I will really take care of the lyrics and the melody because those are the things that people will answer more to. Um, I noticed a connection before I want to comment on that when you were talking about um, using the brass section. Um, and then you, you, you commented about using a choir section, so using children's voice, etc. And I just remember that uh, um, Originally, the idea of the, bra of, of, of the brass section was simply to take a choir piece and, 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 and play the exact same part. It's interesting. The, the, the idea of a brass arrangement separate from vocal comes much later in, in history. At the beginning, is, I'm talking about 1600, 1700, uh, when we start developing those, those instruments and, we, and they can sound decently good and they can actually play something, uh, it, it was essentially, let's take a choir piece and just read the exact same parts. We don't even arrange it, we just dump the voices over the brass and give or take the different instrument have the same ranges of the voices, again, give or take. Um, it's not optimal. Today you would adjust things, so shift everything a little bit down or up, depending, but it's a very good first approximation and it sounds very typical. So I think in the in Christmas song, we, re we retain this kind of legacy because the brass part tend to sound like a choir only with the brass sound. And they're written with a similar thing. So that they, they're not super fast part or super, or super big dynamic difference, uh, not more than the voice can take essentially. So th there, there must be some kind of connection somewhere in the, in the, in the tradition. That is fascinating, and I had no idea that that's how those those um, ensembles were originally used historically. Um, adding on to that, if I was trying to, if I wanted to create a Christmassy vibe uh, at home using just what I had, I would also take some inspiration from both Carol of the Bells and War Is Over, and I would have some long notes that were maybe higher and then I'd have a more rhythmic counterpart. And again, of course, Christmas music isn't the only like place we could find this, but I'm pretty sure if I, you know, if you think about do, 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 and then there's, there's faster things happening, there's like rhythm things happening underneath. That kind of, um, it has that sort of nostalgic poignancy, or it can, e it can conjure that quite easily, I think because there's the there's both the stirringness of the more rapid rhythm and the yearningness of the slower melodies um if you guys haven't checked out Tommaso's uh, version of Carol of the Bells it's epic and uh, we can hear this effect in that as well thank you and uh, um you know what the, the interesting thing about Carol of the Bells is that for us 
It's a Christmas or winter song. But the original is an, uh, apparently a Ukrainian song, and the original title is Bountiful Spring. It was originally a spring song. And now maybe it's spring in Ukraine is not the same as spring in, I don't know, Copacabana, okay? <laughs> but, uh, so, but maybe it's still cold. And so, but, but it's interesting that the, the, the original meaning was completely different, <laughs> essentially, than what we assign to it today. For sure. Um, and I once, that reminds me that I once taught um, a little choir in London and one of the songs was Fairy Tale of New York um, because we were starting in September and we were going to finish in December. And there was somebody who really objected to that choice of song because it had a sweary word in it. Um, the original lyric, I think some radio stations have to now play an alternative version because uh, cult the cultural climate has changed, which is another interesting thing because talking about what we can learn from Christmas music, one of the things we can learn is they're like little scrapbooks of different times in history. And actually, again, when I was thinking about uh, this conversation on Monday, I was thinking about the fact that if you watch different period dramas, but that were filmed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even though they're in costume and they've got their hair in like 18th century, what's it? They still look 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. So um, whatever era something was written in, it's kind of like an interesting snapshot of things that were uh, the, the ideals of that era. And, you know, the ideals of the 50s with the Bing Crosby and the White Christmas, there was a certain set of ideals culturally and that were that people aspired to, and maybe those are different now. And um, things like Baby It's Cold Outside, those that lyric is now seen as somewhat questionable. Um, and uh, so, so there's some things that have changed. And, you know, even Santa Baby, it's a fun tune, but it's very much woman as ornament, uh, presence as reward for good behavior. And, you know, when you're an adult, that's really, <laughs> um, so, so there's, there's, it's kind of interesting to, and, you know, in God Rest You Merry Gentlemen, it's like, be mighty because we're going to defeat Satan's power. You need to remain mighty in order to defeat Satan. It's very important. So, um, diff different, different things were considered, uh, of great urgent priority. Yes, and um, thinking of, talking about uh, um, baby, it's cold outside. It's it's an interesting situation because um, those lyrics could can be interpreted in two different ways. I mean, it's simple as that. That's that, that's the problem. Okay, the the problem is the subtext. Is, is this that he is trying to manipulate her to stay, and that's a totally good interpretation, or it is that they are talking and giving each other plausible deniability, and she's totally in the game to stay. And again, since the climate change, the political climate change, that interpretation change, the text per se can support both interpretation. The interesting thing is that people are very strong in like, no, it's one, no, it's the other. Reminds me of another problem. And it's a literary problem. Um, you ever seen the Scottish play <laughs> Macbeth? I, I'm gonna say it online. <laughs> Something's gonna happen if I said it. Okay, and there is Played this. Sword. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, in Macbeth, there is this scene. But Macbeth by Shakespeare, guys. Okay, so the, the famous one. Uh, there is this scene when Lady Macbeth is trying to convince Macbeth to. To, do, to start all the plot and the, the treacherous plot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a very interesting scene because the critics are divided on the meaning on, of, of that scene. And it's exactly the same problem because half the critics says Lady Macbeth is trying to convince Macbeth to, to, to start with all the treachery, the plot, et cetera, et cetera. And so she is the mind behind the operation. He, she's trying to manipulate him. But the other half is, is, is saying, uh, no, Macbeth already wants to do that. And she's just being supportive of his choice and giving him the courage to go ahead with what he already has decided. And the texts support both, exactly both uh, interpretations. So this, and, and, and it's a very big deal, <laughs> okay? Literary critics have spent, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of words on these, and they're, and they're not, then they don't, on, on what was the original intention of Shakespeare is one or the other. Um, I'm starting to believe Shakespeare totally left these 
ambiguous on purpose, <laughs> okay? Specifically because it, so in so different, it, 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 it could bend the, the the theatrical interpretation one way or another depending on when and where and to in front of whom he was doing the the show essentially. But it, it strikes me as kind of the same problem and that the, the text is not enough to specify what is the correct interpretation. And so at this point, the political climate comes in and tells you what is the correct interpretation. And suddenly a song that was innocuous becomes a very problematic song. And it's hard to see it the other way now, <laughs> honestly, but I wonder what kind of Christmas song Shakespeare would have written. Perhaps he has some Christmas sonnets tucked away somewhere. Interesting. I didn't think, think about that. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Um, I'm sadly not a Shakespeare expert. <laughs> and if anybody in the audience know more about Shakespeare, is there any Christmas sonnet by Shakespeare? <laughs> or something like that? Or because I mean, we have the, we have the, if we talk about Shakespeare and seasonal, we definitely have the Midsummer's Night, uh, which is summer, <laughs> okay, and it's very summery if you think that the whole, the whole play is very summery. Um, I don't remember anything specifically wintry though. There must be there. I'm sure that there's something, but like you, I immediately thought, well, I can't think of anything wintry, but I can think of a Midsummer Night's Dream. And then I was thinking, what do I remember off the top of my head? Woodlands, animals, you know, the idea of everyone being outside in the evening is like this warm. Um, so there's sort of festive element to it. Um, and actually, when you're talking about the Nutcracker, I was thinking about um, the importance of magic in longer Christmas pieces. So Christmas Carol, magical ghosts, Nutcracker, magical toys coming alive. Um, it's that poem about St. Nicholas all through the house, blah, 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 blah. You know, I can't, I don't think there's anything, any overt magic, but there's a sort of, there's a, there's a certain mysteriousness, isn't there? And I think that's actually really interesting because with mysteriousness, um, you can bring a little bit of spooky. Um, so mysteriousness can be, that's the whole thing. We don't know if it's benevolent mystery, like, the fact that the toy, I mean, and also it is a bit, if something that's not supposed to be alive, it suddenly comes alive. Like, you know, there's a nutcracker and there's also Chucky, you know? Um, so the, the, <laughs> um, I, I suppose what I'm saying is that you can, as a songwriter, you've got infinite amounts of uh, uh, possibilities with how much of uncanny you inject. And those uncanny things, all those, you know, what makes you feel cozy, it's when something uncanny kind of goes away. If you're if you're in your house and it's and it's and it's raining, you feel all cozy. You feel more cozy because it's raining. So maybe one of the ingredients of feeling festive and cozy is there being just a suggestion of potential uncanny mysteriousness that um, that then becomes resolved. So, talking about the supernatural, then I, I'm noticing a couple of things. First is that in American culture they separate those two elements that you say that the, the benevolent supernatural and then malevolent supernatural and they separate it into different uh, festivities christmas and halloween that's what it is but in, in for instance in europe when we when uh, europe is a very varied um varied um landscape but then, i mean i'm thinking southern europe we don't really do that <laughs> okay so those two elements can still be together, but in American culture, they're really separate. And I'm thinking that many of the, let's say more recent, but not really that recent, uh, cultural products are mixing a few of those things. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of everything about the Grinch, which is Halloween spilling into Christmas or A Nightmare Before Christmas, the movie. Okay, so you have those two elements that are separate in, Ameri in American culture, but somehow they, they still attract each other one way or another. Okay, and, uh, and, and, it, and it became a staple of comedy of having drunk people in Santa suits, okay, doing the craziest things. So it's kind of the, the separation exists, but somehow in our psyche, we realize that this separation is not real and we're still trying to put those two elements together. 
And that's one consideration which is specific for American culture. But the other one is that you, you identify supernatural in Christmas music, and then we identify it in the midnight summer dream. Midsummer night dream. What am I saying? <laughs> midnight summer, midsummer night dream. And it's interesting if you look in in most um, in most cultures, you associate supernatural with the solstice. So essentially, summer and winter, because those are the extreme points. And you associate the normal, regular, everyday world with the equinoxes, so spring and winter. And if you look at, through these lines to different festivities, you, you, you find a not, lot of interesting things. I mean, f for instance, in Christian culture, Easter should be more supernatural than Christmas in Christian culture, because in, on Christmas, Christ is born. On Easter, Christ resurrects. That should be way more supernatural. But if you look at how we celebrate this thing, all the magic is in Christmas. And Easter tend to be a more matter-of-fact holiday, <laughs> in a sense, okay? So it's kind of like there is this seasonal approach to festivities, where the supernatural is on the extreme of, 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 the, of the temperature or climate, and the normal world is on the more mid-temperate situation, essentially. I wonder if we can apply this in music somehow. Well, certainly... If you think about the supernatural element, that would support the diminished chord being the chord of Christmas. Quite a supernatural chord. Um, it's like it's like the having a bit of uncanny that quickly goes away because we have a little bit of instability that we can quickly resolve in a number of different ways. So in that respect, I am on the side of the cooking guy, even though it's not the point he initially made. <clears throat> Send all your hate email to the end. <laughs> it's on writing lesson online.com. <laughs> okay. It could be. It could, I mean, be, be merry. Don't send me hate mail. They're going to send you merry hate mail. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm just imagining them. Merry Christmas, you bastard. <laughs> I've ruined Christmas for everyone. <laughs> Anyway, well, I, I think we went, I think we went pretty far from the original idea, but it's an interesting thing. It's uh, when we talk about those things, we can go culturally really far because after all, all those songs are expression of different cultural tendencies. And so the more you know about these, the, the easier and then it is to write the correct way to write a song that sounds exactly the way you want. And to decide which bit of that you most want to talk about. And when you're talking about the thing of the supernatural and where we find that, it is interesting that it's at the extremes. And it's also interesting that winter is quite a hard time. It is a historically hard time, and it's still a hard time now. And we are having quite a hard winter in different parts of the world for various reasons. And so there's possibly like a more urgent need for the uh, feeling that there's kind of supernatural solidarity of some kind or to draw on ideas that have a lot of energy in them. Exactly. Stamp of approval. <laughs> I agree a hundred percent. Okay, Diana, we are getting to the end of the hour. So, and I know you have something for our, um, for our listener. And I know it's something completely new. So let me put this on the screen and talk about, talk to us about that. Yeah, so if you like to write songs or like to write more songs, have written songs in the past or haven't but would like to start, and you've ever found yourself in a quandary about lyrics, this has got my best condensed wisdom. So there's sort of five ways to think about writing your lyrics and ways to th help you practice writing lyrics because very often we can, if, if we're coming into songwriting from the point of view of playing guitar, so sort of have a piece of paper and a pen, you're like, okay, what should the lyrics be? Uh, line one, blop. And, oh, I don't know if that's the right way to do it. Um, actually, and, and you know, you, 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 that's not how the guitar worked. You didn't just pick up the guitar and were able to play it straight away. So it's got some, some of the best ways I found to help you integrate and lyric writing into your everyday life. 
if it's something that you want to explore and get better at, and I wished I, I would have saved myself a lot of time if I'd known this stuff at the outset. So uh, I think you'll find it really useful if that's something that you're interested in. Here we go. Okay, actually. There we go. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I've been reading that ebook too, and it's amazing. If you, you guys should get it. It's free. It's amazing. It's very short. There is no reason not to get it. Go on that link and get that ebook now. Once you've done that, come back here and get this other ebook. <laughs> if you are a guitar player, you want this one. So this is a, an ebook with 18 tips on making your pentatonic solo sound professional. That's the title. Penta you, everybody knows the pentatonic. One well, of the first thing you learn when you learn to play the guitar, but very few people know how to make this sound good because it's just five notes. And uh, it's, it, it's easy to get lost in just playing the notes and not putting any music in it. But if you learn how to put the correct emphasis on the note, uh, uh, specific tricks on to move around the scale, um, specific uh, um, cliches, if you want, on how to make this pentatonic sound, you can get a good sound out of it immediately. Now, this is not going to be a groundbreaking new sound. It is the conventional sound of guitar, but the conventional sound of guitar is really good. And it's what a lot of people are after. Okay. And you can get these in by getting these, what it is, this ebook. Okay. And training for maybe a day. <laughs> okay. It's really not that, not, not, not that long once you know the tricks and you can put them together and then you can put them together your own way and create your own little style. Um, totally. Well, and again, it's free, honestly. You guys should get all of our free stuff because it's free and because it's going to make you much better. Really, what's the downside? <laughs> okay, go and get all this stuff. You'll find everything uh, linked down in the description of the video. You just need to click there and get our ebooks. Very good. Diana, always a pleasure having you here. I'm always, uh, after you come here, people watch uh, this, um, this live stream. Every time you've been here, people have watched this live stream. And then a few days later, I get some love email, not hate email, like, I loved having Diana there. <laughs> I love the, the, the conversation. So um, thank you for coming. Thank you very much for having me. I always learn a lot from the perspectives that you, you bring. And today is no exception with a brass nugget and many others. So um, I always really enjoy the questions as well that, that um, your audience asks. Very interesting. So it's been a treat as ever. And, um, you know, let's all go and write songs about Bad Santas and Holly and uh, or anything else that uh, expresses a unique spirit of Christmas to us. Thank you and happy holidays to everybody. Whatever, what, what, whatever specific holiday you have, you have a winter holiday. So happy holidays to everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Diana and everybody. Until next time. Enjoy.